Welcome to Yahoo Finance Live. I'm Julie Hyman, along with Jared Blickley here at the New York Stock Exchange. Here are your big three stories at three. Uh, starting with the writer's strike, which is finally coming to an end after nearly 150 days. The deal still has to be ratified by union members, but many are hoping this paves the way for an agreement to end the actor's strike as well. And while the news initially sparked gains for media stocks, the likelihood of rising costs are now weighing on the shares. And the big tech arms race over artificial intelligence is heating up. Amazon making a $4 billion investment in Anthropic, a competitor to OpenAI. Now, the tech giant is looking to keep up with Google and Microsoft, and it'll provide cloud services and chip services for Anthropic as part of the deal. And as Wall Street already feeling IPO fatigue, shares of recent hot names, including Instacart and Arm Holdings, are already coming under pressure in their second week of going public. Uh, Instacart now trading below its IPO price, $30 a share. The move comes amid broader weakness in the market, with stocks on track for their worst monthly performance yet this year, Jared. And let's take a look at all three major indices. We have had an interesting day on Wall Street. Looks like it's still mixed. Dow down just marginally 37 points. S&P 500 up one third of a percent. And the NASDAQ treading water just up about seven basis points. Do want to highlight the Russell 2000, but I just circled up three tenths of a percent. And as we've been talking about here, Julie, uh, it's really been about treasuries and the 10 year treasury note up to 4.54%. Yeah, we have seen this incredible move in U.S. Treasuries. It's driving yields to new multi-year highs, the highest since, what, 2007, yes. 2008 here. Uh, the 10-year rising as much as 10 basis points. In fact, right now it's up 11 basis points at 4.55%. That is the highs of the session thus far. Why are we paying so much attention to 10-year yields? Well, there are a number of different reasons why, right? They have tended to be a headwind for tech stocks in particular. That yield has also started to provide a little bit of competition to risk assets. If I can get what is viewed as a relatively stable and safe investment and get a 4.5% yield, well, maybe I'm going to buy that instead of a more risky asset. Exactly. It's um, there are so many players in the global bond market that it's difficult to parse out exactly who's coming here, coming in, and why. But higher rates generally attract more money. So when we have 4.5 percent, and we haven't seen that in so long, guess what? People want to come in and they want to buy those treasury bonds. To do that, guess what? They need dollars, and so that also raises the dollar. Um, if we can go to the Wi-Fi Interactive, I have a couple charts here. I'm going to show, first of all, how the U.S. Treasury curve has just shifted up. This is where it was a couple weeks ago on 913, and this goes through all the tenors, very shortish from one month all the way out to 30 years, and it has just shot higher. These are no small movements here. Mm -hmm. And just to kind of build on what you were saying there, why does this matter for people who are looking at stocks? When there's volatility, when there are new things happening in the bond market, those markets retrench. People who are trading huge sums of money, they don't have as much operating leverage for, say, buying riskier parts of the market. And so they retrench. And then we see kind of equity prices fall off as well. Just want to show one more thing here. This is a chart of the S&P 500 over two years. These blue dots are when the U.S. Treasury yield is surging higher. And the red dots are when the U.S. dollar is surging higher. It's when they're overbought from their RSI indicator. I'm not going to get into the weeds here. What you'll notice is usually those red dots, when we have surging yields and a surging dollar, those are on the downswings. And we have that taking place right now. And so it just kind of feeds on itself. And then the market corrects and it finds a new equi equilibrium. And then stocks can take off again. But that's what we're waiting for. That is what we're waiting for. And so there's a big debate now about how long yields are going to be at these levels or maybe even higher, right? A yes. big debate in, among market participants have yields gotten as high as they can get. There's also an interesting chart of the day from Jim Reed over at Deutsche Bank where he uh, looks at the question of real return for institutional investors. For long-term investors, yields need to be above inflation, he says, over the long run. And so he brought us this chart for the chart of the day. And he looks at the history here when we have seen um, inflation below 4.5%, which is where the Treasury yield is now. Uh, most of the time, inflation has been below that level. Um, we would want yields to be above that inflation number. So uh, the question is, how long is inflation going to be elevated here? Even if you're in the higher for longer camp right. when it comes to inflation, you don't necessarily put it at four and a half percent, right? Yeah. So in other words, the long-term prospects for treasuries do look relatively attractive is what he seems to be concluding here. Yes, and I, I would just add to that, I think where kind of Powell is 
uh, he's repeating the playbook from the pre-global financial crisis from 2005 to 2007. And that's when the Fed had really high real yields. That's when you take the value of the nominal bond rate. Right now, it's 4.55% in the 10-year. You subtract the core CPI or PCE, however you want to measure inflation. Um, these are at elevated rates right now. We know the policy lag effect. We don't have to get into that because that's mm -hmm. its own can of worms. But uh, there are real consequences. And we've been at a very tight uh, market for some time. Yes, we have. So let's talk yes. more about it. <laughs> All right, let's get a check on the markets. Uh, we've already done that. Uh, we're seeing uh, stocks in a mixed mode right here in the 10-year in the Treasury yield at 4.54%. Now you can see the Dow has dipped in a negative territory. But I'll tell you what, these movements in the stock market, we're not seeing too much movement today. Also, it is a Jewish holiday and a lot of people just surveying the floor out here to my right. Uh, we're not seeing a whole lot of movement. And as we kick off the final week of September, stocks falling across all three major indices on track for the worst month of the year. Here to discuss further is Rob Hayworth, Senior Investment Strategy Director at U.S. Bank Asset Management Group. Thank you for joining us here today. Uh, in general, September is back to school, but it, it tends to be the worst month of the year, and we're seeing that play out so far. Your thoughts? Yeah, no, September has been tough, and it's uh, really all to the Fed. We've seen uh, markets have done very well uh, to start the year, and, and as the Fed has really put through its higher for longer mandate, we've, had, we've seen markets have to catch up, and that's both the bond market and the stock market catch up to that concept. With 10-year Treasury yields moving higher, that's put uh, uh, interest rate sensitive securities under pressure and investors have kind of retrenched on what have been the strongest performers for the year uh, in the uh, in the tech stocks and the secular growth names. Uh, and so the market's kind of been on sale to your point earlier about kind of in a risk off mode as we've seen a stronger dollar, higher rates, uh, and it, it's tough to compete with that. Yeah, and you if you look at some of the risk factors that are out there, uh, Rob, they feel like they're rising, right? You now have an auto workers strike. You have a potential government shutdown looming, and there's been a lot of talk about how much that could carve out of GDP growth. Um, you have the uh, student loan repayment that is starting up again on, on uh, Sunday. And then you also have oil prices, <laughs> That's just to throw another one in there, that have been elevated. With all of these factors, are stocks going to be able to, you know, begin a rally again. Yeah, and and kind of the challenge with all that is is you have a lot of uncertainty, and particularly with the government shutdown, we'll get more uncertainty, or assuming the government shuts down, more uncertainty because we won't get a lot of the economic data we've gotten used to that we've been relying on to think about what is the Federal Reserve going to do in the future? How are they going to react? Uh, because they very much need to see that data on inflation and earnings, and that kind of means we won't get a lot of information until we start seeing third quarter earnings uh, Friday, uh, October 13th with the with the money center banks. So uh, it'll put us a, a bit in an information, uh, a dark information period where we just won't be getting enough information to to think about what the forward environment is. So that I think that's good. That'll take some sentiment out of the market. Um, uh, but that said, right, there's we've retrenched it to a level where uh, things could also get better. This is a, an economy where the consumer has been extremely resilient. And yes, we're going to see student loan repayments start, but the, the expectation is it's modest. We're seeing pay increases, which tend to hurt corporate margins, but that helps the consumer, helps them uh, have staying power, even though oil prices are a little bit higher at 90, around $90 a barrel, um, but certainly something they can weather when they're seeing uh, average hourly earnings grow in that 4.3% range. So uh, there's some, some, you know, this appears kind of like a muddle through economy where uh, things could get a little worse, but there seems to be enough staying power in that consumer and even in earnings expectations coming from Wall Street for the economy to, to kind of muddle the way it's, its way through and the market to find some footing eventually as we get through some of these uncertainties. All right, we got this uh, nice graphic on the screen about could oil hit $100 a barrel. I want to ask you about that. Uh, Jamie Dimon was out a couple weeks ago. He said $120, $150 is what he's looking for in the next 12 months. We have the Strategic Petroleum Reserve in the U.S., um, which is just starting to be refilled right now. It's back at basically 40-year lows. We have OPEC Plus running a very tight market. How, how high do you see oil going over the next quarter, over the next year? 
Well, fortunately, the next quarter tends to be a softer period for oil demand because of winter, right? So as we get into the winter season, we're not driving as much, we're not traveling as much. A lot is going to depend upon what happens with air travel in particular. Do we see the world start to travel a lot more and demand pick up? Oil demand has been more resilient than I think many expected. OPEC now has spare capacity to bring back online with Saudi Arabia and Russia, both trimming their output uh, into year end. So there's some some room for prices to come down if those supplies come back online. That said, we it would take some uh, amazing uh, demand resilience, I think, to hit hit those higher prices. Or we may be facing some sort of challenge, right? If we if we get into more geopolitical risks, but but for now that doesn't seem to be the case. I, I think I'm a little more cautious on the upside here for oil because there is room for supplies to restart, whether it's Saudi Arabia and Russia coming back online, uh, Iranian oil to come back into the market, which we're hearing some whispers about. And then uh, we've seen low investment really from U.S. producers, and there's room for that to, to tick up uh, as rig counts have been coming down for the last month. Um, all of that said, Rob, we've already seen a, a pretty substantial increase in oil prices and prices at the pump, according to AAA, are up about 20 percent uh, so far this year. Goldman Sachs out with a note today saying, yes, we're cutting our GDP forecast as a result of this, but it's not too much of a big deal. Uh, is it is that your view as well, sort of what we've seen already and the effect that it could have on consumer spending? Yeah, our, our U.S. bank economics team is that we do narrowly avoid recession this year, even though growth probably slows over the next couple of quarters. I mean, and, and I keep in mind, we've had fairly solid uh, and surprising economic growth to, in the first half of the year. The first two prints of 2023, the first two quarters of 2023 have already been growing at a two plus percent annualized rate. Uh, so we're we're really, we've seen really fairly robust growth so far. So even though we, we see growth coming down, we think we can narrowly avoid that recession, even with slightly higher oil prices, somewhat resilient uh, uh, inflation prints, but then you still have a consumer that's benefiting from those wage gains. So. So we we think we can probably narrowly avoid that uh, risk. Well, we'll take that good news and hopefully run with it. Have to leave it there. Rob Hayworth, Senior Investment Strategy Director at U.S. Bank Asset Management Group. Thank you. Thank you. Well, moving on. To, thanks. Moving on to some other stories we're watching right now. Hollywood writers reached a tentative agreement with the studios on Sunday to end a historic strike that started in early May and it's lasted nearly 150 days. The Writers Guild of America has reached a tentative deal with the Alliance of Motion Picture and Television Producers, which bargains on the behalf of major studios like Warner Brothers, Disney, Netflix, and Paramount. Now, all of these were trading higher today, uh, earlier. Yes, um, earlier, mixed But board now, now we have seen, yes, a mixed board, which is kind of interesting here because I think the first plus reaction was, Yay, at least part of this is done. Mm -hmm. These guys can go out and start to get things into production again. But then I think investors took a step back and thought about the other side of this, which is that the studios were saving a lot of money by not making shows. Um, and if you recall, when Warner Brothers recently came out with a positive free cash flow forecast, even though they cut their EBITDA forecast, the free cash flow was seen as positive. Yeah, it's almost turning into the oil patch here. Um, <laughs> let's go to the Wi-Fi Interactive. I do have a couple charts to show here. Um, here's our look at our streaming intraday. And as you, this, if you were to look at this, you would not say, oh, Apple is streaming company. So yes, there's a, a little bit of that going on. But you can see kind of a mixed board there where there's just in favor of the uh, larger companies. Um, and then checking out our movie board, we had uh, AMC president Adam Aaron coming out, uh, celebrating the move, saying it's time to get back to the movies, you're going to have more content. Not surprisingly, AMC up 6% there. But this is a stock that has just been decimated this year. The uh, conversion from the ape shares, that whole thing did not go well. It's just more dilution. So I'm not sure there's much of a story there. But I think for TV viewers, probably the biggest winners here because we get our game shows back right away with soap operas, new shows, uh, things like that. Late night nature. talk shows, yeah, I think. Late night there's talk some shows. Talk if you love those, those jokes, back. well, they're coming back to a TV <laughs> station near you. I guess so, yes, exactly. All right. We are also watching shares of William Sonoma, the stock jumping today after private equity. Uh, Leonard Green increased its stake in the home goods retailer. You can see it's up over 11.5%. Leonard Green's fund now has a 5% ownership stake in WSM. 
And, um, you know, the home builders have, ha have had a mixed story this year. If we go to the Wi-Fi Interactive, I'm going to chart this real quickly. Everything on my screen here is up today, but the, the square that counts is Williams-Sonoma. That's down 11, up 11 percent, far and away bigger than everything else. And here is the year-to-date board. Uh, if we put this on an equal weight basis, you can see Williams-Sonoma in the middle of the top row. And over the last month, it is really uh, the only one in the green here. So kind of an idiosyncratic story with respect to Williams-Sonoma. But they really capitalized on uh, this run here where after the mega caps were done really showing their force and strength and at the end of June, a lot of cyclicals stepped up. Williams-Sonoma looks like they're one of them. They are one of them. Williams-Sonoma has been relatively unique within the category. And this uh, strategy was shown in their last earnings report. They've held the line on price. That has been what is relatively unique about Williams-Sonoma. Now, that has cost them in some ways in terms of volumes, right, sure. in terms of what they're selling through. But analysts have been relatively positive on what it has done for margins. And so since their last earnings report in August, we've seen a number of price target increases and some positive commentary around the stock, and then followed by this news that they're getting this investment from Leonard Green. Leonard Green, which has invested private equity firm that's invested in a number of consumer names, the Container Store, probably notably, sure. Shake Shack as well. So that's why it's given it a little extra boost today. Um, and one of the other stocks we're watching today is Alcoa. Uh, those shares are on the move, down by about 6.5%. The U.S. aluminum producer are appointing a new president and chief executive of the company. It's the former chief operating officer, William Opplinger. He's succeeding Roy Harvey now. Opplinger, or Opplinger, has been with the company since 2016. Um, according to reports, this is a bit of a surprise that yes. this is happening. This was not a planned succession, hence uh, the decline that we're seeing in the shares. And by the way, the shares are down 41% already this year. So we've already seen uh, some weakness and now making this management change amidst that. Yeah, I, I don't have a lot to add to that, but um, the, the outgoing CEO uh, oversaw a huge transition. Mm -hmm. Alcoa, this is a company, well, we used to kick, kick off earnings season yep. every, every quarter with Alcoa just because they happened to be first. Uh, there was a lot of attention on them throughout the Trump administration because of the steel tariffs, uh, but they have been under having a rough go of it here. So we'll have to see in the coming days why exactly this move was made. Yes. I think that'll come out a little bit later. I suspect it will. By the way, um, LME Aluminum is down only 6% this year. So if you look at the 41% slide in the shares, obviously it's not tracking. Commodity, yeah, the commodity exactly. can trade quite a bit differently sometimes. Yes, in this case, know. it definitely is. All right, we're just getting started here at Yahoo Finance Live. Coming up, the AI race is heating up. Amazon making a multi-billion dollar bet on the AI firm Anthropic, but it might not be enough to lead the tech giant to new heights. We'll discuss. Also, earnings season rolling on. A report from Nike could also have implications across multiple companies in the retail sector. It's always earnings season. And we'll get analysts insight on what to expect for the sneaker giant's quarterly results. Don't go anywhere.
Congress did end the student loan payment pause. Bills will be going out as payments are due in October. And we're really encouraging people to take a look at all of the affordable repayment options. We've created the SAVE plan, which is the most affordable repayment plan ever. We already have 4 million people in it. The first thing we would advise any student or family that's managing student loan debt is not to wait. The time to be thinking about repaying your student loan debt is today, not waiting until the last moment. President Biden and his administration is committed to taking action in order to relieve student debt. The president has also announced a plan B under the Higher Education Act and will hopefully be able to provide borrowers even more relief. Because we've had such a long break, so a lot of people don't even know exactly how much they owe, who their lender is. And so for some people, it starts with answering those basic questions. The cost of attaining a higher education degree has become unaffordable and unattainable. And so we really do need to look at common sense solutions, ensuring that states are able to adequately fund their higher education. Women earned degrees at a higher rate. They were enrolled more in college. So they've taken on more degrees. They've taken on more debt. Then they emerge with a degree and they are earning less. And unfortunately, it takes them longer to pay off that debt. The president is trying to put into place things that will help people who go to college. And we should be really helping people go to college and doing it in an affordable mm. way. I was a high school math teacher right out of college and you know I got my first contract for $29,000 and thought it was like a million bucks. For most folks, they know today that not that much and you can't actually kind of afford to, to live off that money. Really kind of contributed to feeling a little bamboozled kind of by the, the system itself. I think the number one thing is, you know, generally speaking, we tell people not to fall victim to people calling you and asking you for advice. If it sounds too good to be true, it usually is too good to be true. Everybody thought that Student loans of all stripes persist through bankruptcy, but in fact, certain private student loans do not. And we brought a lawsuit to try to stop Navian from collecting on those loans um, for thousands of people and we're successful. What we're hearing from a lot of employers and from a lot of students are questions about mental health, about well-being, and student loan repayment is part of that conversation as they think about their financial well-being. So all of these types of benefits are becoming more the norm as a new generation comes into the workforce. I think these are important questions that families are asking now when they're looking at um, the potential of taking on student loan debt. What's the long-term return on investment? And that's what folks are asking. So the real question to ask isn't whether it's good or bad debt, it's whether I can pay it back and whether it will be sustainable after I invest in myself. We have a survey at Prince Review called College Hopes and Worries. The number one survey for the past seven years running has been concerned about assuming too much debt to pay for college. For loan borrowers, they may not feel that the loan itself is worth it, but the education is. The education is really important, but people are going to have to start asking, is it even worth taking out these loans because it's just so expensive. Let's do a quick check of the markets now, sponsored by Tasty Trade. We are seeing a mixed picture here for stocks. The Dow, not much change, but a little bit to the downside, about 18 points off. The S&P and the Nasdaq, also not much change, but they're slightly to the upside here. It looks like it is energy that is leading the pack higher today. As we've been talking about, oil prices um, have been sort of holding near uh, recent highs, and so energy stocks seem to be following suit. Also, let's take a look at the VIX, shall we? Uh, we are seeing... What are we seeing the VIX do today? I'm I'm guessing not a heck of a lot. <laughs> it was 17.6. So not showing crazy volatility uh, today on this relatively muted trading session. That's right, Julian. We're watching oil prices as well. They've soared 30% since June, and Goldman Sachs is raising its target for Brent $200 per barrel. And the concern now is that higher prices are going to take a toll on economic growth. Ines Ferre is here with a closer look. Ines. Yeah, Jared. And as you said, when you have higher oil prices, of course, you also have higher gasoline prices. The concern there is that it'll eat into disposable income. Also, of course, the concern is that diesel prices being higher, that that means that the, to transport goods, that goes up and therefore goods and services also goes up. But Goldman Sachs has a note out saying that higher oil prices could be a manageable headwind for the economy. Basically, Goldman Sachs analysts noting that the 
the price of oil has gone up since June by about $20 per barrel. And there's three reasons why they're th saying that they don't think that this will have a big impact on consumer spending or on GDP, even though they did lower their GDP forecast fractionally. And this is because one of the things that they're saying is that the magnitude of the oil increase by $20 over the last uh, several months, well, that is not as big of an increase that we saw back in 2008 or the big increase that we saw at the beginning of last year in the first half of 2022. Also, the economists at Goldman Sachs saying that a GDP headwind would be partially offset by capital expenditure in the energy space and also lower electricity prices because if you take into account the price of coal, which has fallen back this year, and also the price of natural gas, which is needed for turbines to make electricity, then you should have electricity prices coming down a bit. And lastly, what they're saying is that the Fed is unlikely to tighten further in response to higher oil prices when you did see inflation trending down. Now, Goldman Sachs has been pretty bullish also on oil, as you mentioned. Recently, Goldman Sachs uh, also increasing its price target uh, on Brent to $100 a barrel in the next 12 months, guys. All right. Thank you for that. Ines Ferre. Well, Amazon has just made a billion dollar bet on the AI firm Anthropic in an attempt to rival Microsoft's partnership with OpenAI and ChatGPT. Amazon announcing early this morning that it will invest up to four billion dollars to build, train and deploy its AI models using custom chips. Here to help dig into the details of this is Dr. Rana El Kalyubi, an author and deputy CEO of the AI company SmartEye, and Chris Callison Birch, a professor of computer and information science at the University of Pennsylvania. Thank you both for being here. Really appreciate it. Um, uh, Dr. El Kalyubi, let's start with you here. Um, what is your impression of the way that Amazon is sort of entering into this investment? In other words, um, there are some critics who have said Amazon has not been as aggressive in um, generative AI. Is this the sign that that is perhaps changing? Yeah, I think this is a very strategic move on Amazon's uh, behalf. Uh, it allows Amazon Web Services to partner with companies um, and, and make the Anthropic APIs and, and technologies available to companies that are already housing their data at Amazon. And so I think that's very interesting. That will open up a whole new kind of generative AI interface for the Amazon Web Services. Um, and I also think the potential use of Anthropic and Amazon Alexa could be very interesting because of course um, that allows Alexa to become way more conversational. So I, th I think it's very strategic and makes a lot of sense. And Chris, your big picture views here, please. Uh, I agree with Rana. I think this is a really great strategic move by Amazon. Um, Amazon, like many other companies, uh, was caught flat-footed by the release of ChatGPT back in November. I think m most places were surprised by how much of a breakthrough this technology was. Uh, but Amazon was a, an unexpectedly surprised. I think of all the tech giants, you would have expected Amazon to have a strategy already in place for these large language models. Uh, it has the compute infrastructure. It has the buying power to collect talent to train these things. And the fact that Amazon got surprised and is sort of playing catch up um, was a little unexpected in my book. But I think this is a really excellent strategic move that will help them catch up. Chris, let's talk applications. Um, you've got one of the applications of AI right behind you. In fact, a bunch of them in the R2s that are little statues, uh, that are little uh, figures that are behind you. Um, you know, what, are, what do you think are the key ways that we could see Amazon start to deploy some of this generative AI, both uh, visible to consumers and not? So I think one of the amazing things about generative AI is that it has the potential to transform a huge range of different industries. And I think Amazon, by partnering with Anthropic, is going to allow other companies to integrate it into their businesses via the AWS services. So you could imagine startup companies offering intelligent tutoring systems or more intelligent web search or personalized shopping, all these sorts of things that would be possible by building on top of the AWS infrastructure that a lot of startup companies already use, and then being able to call out to the generative AI technology that Amazon is strategically partnering with Anthropic to provide. 
And Dr. El Kalubi, uh, when we think about this deal, one of the things that leapt off the page to me was uh, Amazon using, at least designing its own chips for the process for Anthropic to use. How big of this, how big is this in terms of the deal, uh, just kind of cementing uh, Amazon and Anthropic together, perhaps more so than Microsoft and ChatGPT? Your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think what we're learning is in this space, it's so important to think about the end-to-end -end system, starting with the compute and the chips, all the way to how you train and retrain and kind of deploy these models. Um, I think it's very interesting that they are, um, I, I mean, I think it's it's a win-win situation because I, um, for Anthropic, it's really powerful and strategic to have access um, to, to this much compute um, and, and kind of specifically designed um, chips. Um, and I think that's going to allow Anthropic and Amazon together to move really fast. Well, and it's also interesting, Rana, that um, you have to wonder if this is part of the impetus even behind the partnership for the chip partnership, but also for Amazon to sort of, for Anthropic to be using AWS, at least for its main functions, that that's sort of locked in here. I mean, it seems like a, a bit of a coup for them as well on that front. Absolutely, um, a lot of, I mean, most of the cost at these companies, it's not its not the people cost, it's actually compute cost. And so to have access to the Amazon web, you know, the, the Amazon cloud uh, and Amazon compute to, to train these models, I think that's really powerful. We're also seeing in, in general, within the generative AI space, a move towards um, models that potentially work on the edge, not necessarily on the cloud. So again, um, by having Amazon build these specific chips, that could be one of the use cases as well. Uh, Chris, last one to you here. I, and I want to get your bigger picture view as a professor of computer and information scientists over at UPenn. What's the, what's the zeitgeist like in the classroom? Are students now clamoring to get into AI? Was there already an interest? Does this not move, move the needle at all? It's incredible, like the student demand is off the charts. This semester I'm teaching approximately 750 students, like more than I've ever taught before. And I think that they recognize the value in this. And I think Amazon's strategic investments at this $4 billion level just shows like this is a incredibly transformative technology that's going to change how all of our lives are working. And I think it's a really great strategic investment and I expect to see more such things in the future. Yeah, definitely seems that way. Thanks so much to you both, Dr. Rana El Kalyubi and Chris Callison Birch, thanks. Well, coming up, investors are eagerly awaiting Nike's earnings release on Thursday and signs of a slow consumer have certainly affected the sneaker giant in recent quarters. We're going to talk to Forrester Research's Sucharita Kadali on some of the biggest headwinds for Nike. That's on the other side of the break.
Nike stock heading lower today following a downgrade from buy to hold from Jefferies, citing the resumption of student loan repayments next week becoming a key pain point for consumer stocks. Comes just days ahead of the company reporting earnings on Thursday. And here to discuss further is Sucharita Kodali from Forrester Research. Thank you for joining us here today. I'm wondering what you're expecting. Um, a lot of people mentioning the student loan payments, but we also have the China story. Not sure if that's totally in the rear view mirror. What are you looking for? Yeah, I think that the China story is probably the biggest one here for Nike. Um, the challenge is, is that Nike has been very dependent on the Asian market, certainly on the Chinese consumer. Um, not only do you have issues with the softening of the Chinese consumer and their spending ability, but also just a lot of uh, just geopolitical risk that is there. Everything from manufacturing to um, just uh, whether or not there is going to be enough of a detente to allow the resumption of of trade as we knew it, um, you know, across borders. So I think that's really the biggest issue for Nike since such a big part of its overall revenue mix is, is, is coming from international sources. The student loan repayment issue, I'm not as con concerned um, for a company like Nike. They are a they are a brand where consumers who want their product will find ways to purchase their product. Um, so it is, it's not, it's it, it, the, the student loan repayment issue has more of an impact on sectors like automotive, potentially even housing. Um, I don't think it's going to have as much of an impact on branded apparel to be, you know, to be completely candid. Yeah, and indeed, um, Jeffries is the firm that's the downgraded the stock today in part because of uh, what they're saying could be a hit from the student loan repayment. But uh, you, something you mentioned, I want to pick up on, Sucharita, and you said if people really want it, they will find a way to pay for it. And one of the things that has been amazing about Nike, for those of us who followed it for a long time, has been the sustainability of its brand being hip, right, of people wanting the shoes. Is that still the case in sort of a decline, more declining economic environment? Does it still have that cachet? There are absolutely things that consumers will always want, regardless of the economic circumstances, whether or not Nike um, happens to have the hot hottest shoes at this moment in time. Um, I think that that is something that sneakerheads would would be happy to you know to share which ones that they they happen to be um, you know kind of highest on their their most wanted list right now. Um, but the truth is that um, that that it, it is still very much a category that consumers do want. It is still very much a category where the idea of the drop is incredibly valuable and is a big driver of demand. Um, a significant, the biggest issue for a company like Nike is if there is a glut of inventory, um, that may potentially have an impact on um, whether or not the brand is as desirable because so much of the value of the most desirable products is the scarcity, not the oversupply. Um, we've learned that over and over again from luxury brands, from Coach to Gucci, that when they are over distributed, it is a big problem for the health of the brand. Um, and Nike needs to figure out if they do have an inventory glut, what they're going to do with that excess inventory in a way that still preserves the um, the desirability of their highest ticket items, which are the Jordans and the Air Force Ones. Um, I'd like to uh, direct everybody's attention to the Wi-Fi Interactive here. I have a year-to-date look on the apparel sector, and it's a mixed board. Nike stands out. It's, a, it's the highest in terms of market cap, so that's that big 22.7 you see right there. Uh, but then we have Lululemon. That's up 20%, and I know you don't cover all of these, but it's a very bifurcated market. In the upper left, you have Amber Crombie and Fitch up 125%. Uh, at the bottom row, you got Foot Locker down over 50%. Nike is down about half of that. Uh, what do you explains? What do you think explains the bifurcation most in this group? Yeah, it is. Um, it's interesting because um, overall, the apparel sector has not done terribly well through the pandemic, and then, of course, subsequent, um, even in the last year or so, it has not kept pace with the overall growth of retail, um, and they've also not been able to to tap into, so to speak, some of the inflation gains that other sectors like grocery or even restaurants have been able to 
glean positive revenue growth from. Um, so the apparel sector, I think overall is challenged. And as you mentioned, there are some players that are faring okay in the midst of that. I think that some of that is probably based on the fact that they had such abominable pandemic um, periods and their 2020, 21 and 22 were so bad that any type of normalization is good for them. Whereas for Nike, it did outpace the industry through much of the pandemic um, and it's now stabilizing a bit and their year over year growth is not great, however, although it's positive. Um, but what is more important, I think, to look at when you're looking at a sector like apparel is you got to look at the comps relative to 2019. It's com comparable to the pre-pandemic years. Um, and if there is a company that has been able to capture all of the inflation gains and inflation between 2019 and now alone is like 20%. So the consumer has had to pay 20% more on most goods. And then you have a company like Nike that not only has been able to raise its prices that much, but has also seen um, the consumer actually purchasing more. Um, and that's also in spite of challenges globally, like in China and even softening demand in Europe. Um, it's a pretty good story. And it suggests to me that there's still very much demand for the product. Um, there's some talk, a lot. There's, there's a whole school of thought that is very down on Nike's wholesale strategy, thinking that they pulled out of too many wholesalers too quickly. Um, but when you actually look at the numbers, it's direct to consumer numbers, not only are very strong with double digit growth, um, it's actually been driving more of its margin. And that is where in fact, a lot of the desirability and the brand promise are, be, are able to be communicated as, as strongly as they are. So, Sucharita, I'm going to look a little bit further ahead here, right? We've got earnings that are coming, um, and then we've got another earnings report after that. But then after that is the holiday season. And I'm just curious if you think that Nike is going to be able to maintain that strength, and then if you also have sort of a more general comment about what you expect for retail this holiday season. Yeah, so Nike um, has has been up uh, from a revenue standpoint, positive numbers um, year to date. So I don't think that um, in calendar year to date, uh, because their fiscal year is is uh, is off cycle. But um, but in terms of looking at that momentum, and given the fact that they are um, positive in a very very tough apparel environment. Um, in an environment where consumers are not necessarily purchasing that much in the apparel and footwear category overall. Um, they're headed into the holiday season, I would say more strongly positioned than a lot of other brands. And uh, again, you know, compared to what we're seeing, what we saw pre-pandemic, if you compare it to the 2019 numbers, um, it is comping nicely. Um, the issue is that whether it's going to do well compared to last year or some of the inflated expectations that maybe some firms had, um, I think that that still remains to be seen. But when I look at the overall picture and look at how it's trending compared to um, a longer time frame, which I think is a more fair comparison, um, I, I'm not as nervous about Nike as I would be about some other larger big box retailers, multi-category retailers that have a lot um, they have a worse prognosis than, than a company like Nike. All right, we have to leave it there, but really appreciate your insights. As always, Sucharita Kodali from Forrester Research. Coming up, it's time to buy shares of McDonald's. Well, at least that's what our next guest is saying. He's going to tell us why he's calling the fast food company resilient and recession proof. That's up next.
Poultry giants Tyson Foods and Purdue Farms, they're finding themselves under federal investigation, coming after a report that some of their contractors are employing migrant children. Here with the details is Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan. Alexis. Hi, Jared. Yes, this is the U.S. Labor Department reportedly investigating the two poultry producers on complaints that they had or have migrant children working in their meat processing facilities in Virginia, those two separate companies, two separate facilities. Uh, these are sanitizing workers, reportedly, and they are working during overnight shifts. That's the way that this complaint is lodged. Now, both Purdue Farms and Tyson, they both tell Yahoo Finance that they've received no notice of a probe. Um, but the two companies responding to our questions really differently. Purdue, for their part, telling Yahoo Finance that the workers at issue are employed by a third-party sanitation company in Tennessee that's based in Tennessee called Fayette in Industrial. And they say this, the most important thing is ensuring underage labor has no place in business. We are conducting a third-party audit of our procedures. And they also say they plan to cooperate fully with any government inquiry. Now, Tyson, for its part, said that because the company had not received a notice of any inquiry, that they therefore cannot comment at all. Now, together, Purdue and Tyson, they produce about one third of all of the poultry that is sold in the United States. Uh, so those two absolute giants here in this industry. And this all came to a head after the New York Times Magazine last week issued a report of a 14-year-old migrant worker who was working in a reportedly Purdue's facility and suffered a very severe arm injury. So we're still waiting to hear what the Department of Labor has to say and how extensive this probe is. Jared? Um, I'll take it from here, Alexis. What kind of fines are we talking about potentially if it does, if it is found that there's a liability here? Yeah, Julie. So one place to look is back in February. That's the most recent case where the Department of Labor did find a company called Packers Sanitation Services, and they're headquartered in Wisconsin. After an investigation by the department, they found that the company had employed 102 miners in meat uh, processing facilities. They were fined get this, just $15,000 approximately for, for each violation, so each worker that was working there illegally. All told, that fine comes to a roughly $1.5 million. So when you're looking at a company like, let's say, Tyson Foods, that's a public company here, uh, Purdue being private, but revenue for the last 12 months for Tyson, uh, $53 billion a drop in the bucket here in terms of these fines. So, uh, you know, that's probably why you're not seeing the stock move too, too uh, much on this news. Makes sense. And we thank you for the report. Yahoo Finance's Alexis Keenan. Well, stocks are mixed today. The S&P 500's gains are being led by energy stocks. That group is up today even as oil prices are falling and energy stocks have underperformed the underlying commodity this year. In other words, in other words, it hasn't been sort of neck and neck between the two. Let's talk to an investor who likes one oil stock in particular, Ken Mahoney. Mahoney Asset Management's chief executive uh, officer is back with some picks here. And let's start with that oil stock, Ken. It is ExxonMobil. Um, and it has been an interesting ride for these oil stocks. They've been, perform been performing very well this quarter, but they haven't necessarily kept pace with the gains that we've seen in the underlying commodity. So why are you looking at Exxon? Yeah, your math is correct. Actually, we went sub $70 a barrel a couple of times now. So from 70 to 90 something, yeah, it's like 27, 28% increase in the underlying, uh, underlying oil. And of course, Exxon didn't go up that much altogether. But you know, I, look, we, we are mostly growth managers. We like technology, but we're trying to find some positions outside of technology. Should they falter? Should valuations come in a little bit? You know, it seems like there's a $70 put somewhere there. You know, every time we go down there, Saudis come up and say, Hey, we're going to cut a million dollars, a million barrels a day, and they've done that twice. So I think investors can feel comfortable. There's some type of downside. You know, when you invest, it's always risk and reward. And I think for investors, they kind of know the downside is something low seventy dollars a barrel. Uh, Exxon page a three and a half percent dividend. You can see the kind of chart there. Again, made a nice move after being choppy most of this year. But I think it's a good way to kind of invest outside of tech as a way to kind of you know get a decent dividend, more of a value play. And hopefully there is that put, which I believe there is, in the low 70s. 
It seems like it's been energy or tech. But I want to talk about another field, consumer discretionary. You're also talking about McDonald's, which you like. And I want to go to the Wi-Fi Interactive here. Um, just looking at the year-to-date chart, it is off of its highs here, record highs. But on a 10-year basis, you can see maybe it's just come down to the lower end of its channel here. I'm talking technicals. What do you like about the fundamentals here? So the fundamentals are interesting. It's, it's always one thing to say, oh, technology is going to help a company. You know, with McDonald's, it's, it's really amazing what they've done here. They have kiosks now if you go into McDonald's and you can order kiosks. And it, it's just a, it's a nice environment. It's a screen and so forth. You know, and they found, you know, that people that actually go on there uh, onto the kiosk spend maybe 20 or 30 percent more than if they wait in line. You know, you go up in line and you kind of look up and you're kind of just, and then you move over because people are waiting and so forth. But the kiosk is very interesting. Not everybody's going to order in kiosk. It's not going to be everything there. But the look at those numbers, and again, we can't extract 20% growth because of the kiosk. But that's, again, when you're trying to find a catalyst, what's going to bring the stock back near your highs, I think technology, they've, they've really taken a big bite into technology. And I think it's a really, again, it could be one of the discretionary consumers, as you said. That's kind of sleeper. Everybody knows the name. It's McDonald's. But again, that kiosk could be a game changer. And um, let's talk about stuff that you don't like, Ken. <laughs> and we start here yes. with Macy's. Now, I think you're not alone on this one. This has not exactly been no. a loved name, but it has come back to some extent. Um, and we were just talking in a segment a few minutes ago about going into the holiday season here. Why should investors steer clear of uh, Macy's? Well, the management guidance even told us, you know, we like companies that beat estimates yeah. and raise guidance, and they actually lower their guidance. And you think about, if you're gonna be in retail, if you had to pick one out, it wouldn't be Macy's. Now think about Prime Day for Amazon. They did $12.7 billion of revenues in one day, either July 12th or July 14th. And then you look at Macy's, the entire year, they do about $25 billion in revenues. So basically one day in Amazon is about six months of buys and of, of selling there in Macy's. So I think it's a pretty big difference. Uh, again, I think stocks that make lows, uh, new lows continue to make more lows. So I think technically it's kind of trapped, lower guidance, and if you're gonna be with the retailer, why even be around Macy's when you have companies like Amazon that in one day do half the revenue they do in the entire year? All right. Also want to talk more broadly about U.S. small caps. And for that, we're looking at the Russell 2000 or the IWM ETF. Uh, and I want to pull up the Wi-Fi Interactive one more time just to show the choppiness that we have seen this year. Um, we've seen a couple highs here and we are marching back down to the lows. And in fact, if we look over the last three years, maybe we're just going sideways over the last two. What are you seeing in the small cap space? I'm seeing that. A lot of nervous investors. We are in a narrow market, whether we like it or not. You know, we always done the underrated uh, S and P 500, and then you know, put in Apple, Microsoft, and all them, and kind of look at the difference. Look, investors are still very nervous. They want big liquid stocks, and small caps don't fit that definition. So, for us to get a rally, I think first it's going to be led by those tech names, Microsoft. After having a really difficult August, September, the leadership I believe is going to come back to Apple, Microsoft, all those leaders that happened before this mess, and before we get to small caps. It's going to take some time. So I think most money is going to go into liquid names, big names. Hopefully they carry the day with good earnings coming up in the uh, you know, third, fourth, uh, fourth week in October. And really, I think small caps right here is really an afterthought. All right. We'll see what happens. Ken Mahoney, CEO of Mahoney Asset Management. Thanks. Good to have you here. Great. Thanks. Coming up, the closing bell on Wall Street. We're checking in on the latest market moves and the top trending tickers. Keep it right here.
Stevanato Group closing the day here with the closing bell on Wall Street. And let's do a quick check of the market sponsored by Tasty Trade. You can see the Dow up there just barely closing green, 43 points. S&P 500 up four tenths of a percent. NASDAQ a little bit more up 45 basis points. And the leading sector of the day was energy with staples, utilities, and uh, looks like uh, real estate all ending in the red there, Julie. And let's talk about some of these stocks to watch during this session. You know, um, there was only one sell rating on Microsoft, and now there are none. Guggenheim is upgrading the software giant to neutral now. The firm citing a tailwind around the positive generative AI narrative. Um, the share's not gaining much today on this as Guggenheim sort of throws in the towel. Just to give some perspective here, there are 54 buys on Microsoft and now seven holds. There were six holds in one cell, so that last cell uh, now no longer in place. But obviously you can tell from those numbers that the sentiment surrounding the company is overwhelmingly positive. Uh, and uh, now Guggenheim saying, they kind of can't can't argue with uh, with what we've seen from yeah. that enthusiasm around. It's usually AI. these kinds of reports that top tick everything, but yeah. you know it just kind of feels that way. But if we go to the Wi-Fi Interactive, I'm going to do a quick chart of Microsoft because it has really held its ground. Uh, better than some of the other mega caps. And this is a year to date look. That's why, well, this is how much you're off their 52 week, uh, 52 week lows. Microsoft up 48%. And here is the year to date chart. Um, you can see there's kind of a neckline right here. A lot of charts looking like this. Um, we'll have to see what comes. I don't want to read too much into this, but this has been a definite stalwart and a recipient of a lot of the, Amer uh, the artificial intelligence largesse in the capital markets. Also got a talk about CarMax Wedbush upgrading its, ra its rating on CarMax's stock, and now it's an outperform. And this is ahead of the company's earnings. The firm saying inflection in growth and market share performance is nearing. Um, I've looked at the uh, automakers this year, not the automakers, the auto sellers this year. And if we could go to the Wi-Fi Interactive one more time, I'm going to show you what's happened year to date. So CarMax is in the upper left, uh, and you can see everything green. They've had really a banner year, 27.7%, and really not off of its highs by that much. For all the talk about inflated used car prices and new car prices and all of that, we really haven't seen a lot of dents in some of these auto manufacturers, or these uh, used car stocks. Excuse I mean, me. the next question is going to be for the auto dealers, not so much on the used side, but on the new side. What effect is the strike going to have, right? Are they getting the inventory that they want to sell through? What effect is that going to have on the used uh, car market dynamics as well? So all of that sort of feeding in. I'm really curious uh, when uh, CarMax next reports, when all these dealers next report, what kind of commentary are we going to hear, especially as the auto strike uh, stretches on? Yeah, I think so. And are, are people who are desperate for cars, and I don't know how many are in the situation, but you remember, in the early days of pandemic, we had people who were just desperate for cars, yeah. willing to pay any price. That, no, that, that I guess, inflation narrative is pretty much dead. But uh, I'm, I'm surprised by some of the re resiliency that we're seeing in some of these stock prices. Got to move on to the IPO market, uh, the latest. So the initial public offering market showing signs of fatigue after a nascent restart. And uh, this is among, amid some of the broader weakness that we're seeing in the market. Stocks on track for their worst monthly performance this year. You look at some of the, uh, well, all of those three looks like they closed higher today. And if I go to, uh, let's see if I can get to the Wi-Fi Interactive one more time on the IPOs. <laughs> you got to um, set a just, record today, Jay. Yeah, I'll tell you what. Let's go to Arm Holdings here. I'm going to pull up, um, if I show a three-month chart, that's going to be enough to show the entire history there. You can see that mm -hmm. uptick right there, but down 14.39%. You know, we can go to Instacart, Clavio, um, kind of similar stories here. I don't want to say that the capital markets are thawing too much because we just barely got this restart here. But it is a bit ominous because we had almost no activity yes last year. Uh, finally, things get started this year. And then the month of August, we get a bit of a downturn in the market. September kind of kicking, uh, continuing that. I think October, we're going to inflect upwards in October again. The, the capital markets with IPOs, they kind of rise and fall with uh, whatever the S&P 500 is doing. Yeah. Well, in a broad sense. Uh, uh, just to, to make two comments on this. First of all, there was this whole narrative around the ARM IPO in particular that everybody was going to be watching the first day and that would potentially open the floodgates for more IPOs. And we did end up seeing Instacart and Clavio. 
But on the flip side, are are those in the capital markets really just watching that first day, or are they watching a little bit longer to figure out if they want to put their toe in the water? That's thing one. Thing two is I've been watching the Renaissance IPO ETF, um, which tracks new issues. It doesn't have these in them yet, I don't think, because it takes a little while to, to, for them to enter the index. But it's down 15% since its peak on July 31st. It's actually been performing quite well this year. It's up 25%, but then has rolled over yes. since we've had these big high-profile IPOs. Yep, with the uh, kind of ebbs and flows with the general market. Yes, here. true. Exactly. All right, well, uh, coming up next, the writer's strike is finally coming to an end after nearly 150 days. And while the news initially sparked gains for media stocks, the likelihood of rising costs are now weighing on shares. Joining us now, Laura Martin, Needham & Company Senior Internet and Media Analyst. Laura, great to see you, as always. Um, so I have to say, I was initially a little bit confused today by the stock action. Not the gains, but then the subsequent sort of pullback in some of these stocks. And their narrative seemed to be, well, now if the shows are coming back, these guys are going to have to spend some money again. Is that what, what kind of the narrative is here? Maybe. I think part of it, I think maybe they went up too much because the actors still aren't back at work. So mm -hmm. writers kind of, right. they can start writing, but actually we don't get back to sort of a normalized industry until the actors strike is also, the sag Afro strike is also resolved. So sort of nothing changes right now because writers can go back to work. So your late night can go back and be on the air after this, this agreement is ratified by the 10,000 writers. But really a lot of the content requires the actors to go back to work as well. So I think that's what happened. Like it jumped up because it looks like Hollywood is healing. But really nothing changes until A, they ratify the agreement, the pop, you know, the members, and then the actors have to go back to work before it really has an impact on series and films. So how much of a time lag are we seeing here? Potentially, let's say for the average TV show, the average movie, obviously there are a lot of different other factors and different factors involved here, but how far on average did these companies, did these shows get behind on their writing, on their talent, on their show production? Right. So um, probably about four months. And if the so far, um, because it was a five month strike. Right. So probably they're four months behind. And then we were running into the Christmas sort of um, Thanksgiving holidays. So the worry would be, I think, I think what people are talking about out here in Hollywood is if you solve the, the actor strike in four weeks from now, uh oh, now you're sort of going into Thanksgiving and Christmas and really are the teams back together before January 1st? Do you really start? And that I think is problematic because there's just, they might solve these right going into the holidays so that actually nothing really gets done because you need everybody working in order to get these content, you know, new TV series, new films back to work. Laura, how well are we able to measure the correlation between new programming and subscriber growth. And have we already started to see, it's probably a little early, have we started to see any kind of uptick or indication that there are some cancellations coming because, oh, people are saying, my new show's not gonna come for a while? Um, so I think what we heard from Disney last week, because we were in Orlando with Bob Iger, the CEO, and what he said was, look, we're gonna make lower cost, fewer episodes for our streaming platform and actually also films He's like, we're going to do more sequels and we're going to have fewer numbers um, of Marvel and Star Wars and princesses. So I do think all of these companies that have been losing money in streaming, I think Wall Street is demanding they start, they move to profitability faster, which means we're going to have less content spending um, right in time. Like they, you know, to their credit, writers got minimum numbers of credit per series, but the number of series is about to go down. Um, because all these streamers need to make money because now they're raising capital at a 7% cost and it used to be two years ago, a 0% cost. So Wall Street's screaming. They have to have a return on capital higher than 7% now. So they're going to make fewer shows. So if I, if I take a five year back, if I go back five years in time, I remember when Disney, for instance, I don't know if it was five years ago, but we had all these new players in the market and people started talking about peak content. It seems that moment has passed. Um, and then we're in this new phase where there's a lot more competition for those production do dollars. Uh, who do you see as the winners emerging here? And do you see any kind of uh, any more kind of a consolidation? 
Yes, I do see. I think we have to consolidate because basically growth is zero. And the only way to grow earnings per share is you have to buy something and then you have to sort of get rid of duplicative costs. And that grows your earnings per share for two or three years while you you know, get rid of positions that are duplicated in a consolidation. So I do see more consolidation. Um, and I also see um, the big get bigger and the small are disadvantaged. If you look at the like the public companies in streaming, like Curiosity Stream, Chicken Soup for the Soul, Fubo, there's no competitive advantage to being smaller when you're going up to when you're competing against Netflix and Disney and Comcast and Amazon and Apple. Like there's just no advantage to being small anymore. This has become a land of giants, and so you sort of need to merge or get the heck out of the way because you're going to get stomped on. And you've talked in the past, Laura, about how you think there are going to be some deals on the bigger side. Not necessarily the big guys are going to come gobble up those little players that you talked about, but that we could actually see some substantial big deals here. Does this strike environment now make that more likely? And what's the likeliest next deal do you think we'll see? So, you know, I don't. I, I, I think, this, look, the strikes, to their credit, really, these guilds are protecting new people into the industry. Right, they're protecting the writers and actors that are beginning in the business, getting a living wage. Great, but really, when we're talking about these hundred million dollar films or franchise films, all of those writers and actors have talent agents, and they aren't earning the scale. So I don't really think I think this is for the next generation of writers and actors. It isn't for the people driving the cost structure at film and television today for these big properties. That's my opinion. So um, I think it just makes it, you know, we need these people to be back at work. Otherwise, because their core <laughs> their core business is content creation and content creation has stopped. So what is their value proposition, I think, is a reasonable question. And I think that's why we saw Disney say they're doubling their capex in theme parks um, because they can control the return on capital in theme parks without worrying about strikes shutting them down. Just wait until the, the workforce there unionizes. No, Laura. Um, does, the, does this writer strike agreement put pressure on the actors as well to now come to an agreement? Do you think it makes it more likely? I do. I do. I think everybody wants to get back to work. I don't think anybody wins when, like, there's a lot of unintended consequences of people on the periphery that aren't in either one of these unions that aren't getting paid today. And there's, like, real hardship going on by peripheral you know, workers for this industry that actually aren't on strike, but they can't get anything done until both these unions come back. So yes, I do think that that puts more pressure on the actors to come to a deal, to put everybody back to work in the ecosystem. Oh, hopefully, so we can enjoy our favorite shows. Really appreciate you stopping by, Laura Martin. The likely 2024 presidential matchup heading to the picket line now. President Biden will meet with striking UAW workers tomorrow, putting himself in the middle of the labor debate amid the transition to electric vehicles. And former President Trump not far behind. He's going to be in Michigan on Wednesday, and it comes as he launches a new campaign against EVs. Yahoo Finance senior columnist Rick Newman is here with more. So, Rick, against EVs, what are the details? <laughs> Right. So everything else is politicized in America. So why not electric vehicles? Uh, there's this Republican line that, that Trump has really seized on, which is that Biden caused the uh, United Auto Workers strike because of his fervent support for electric vehicles and all the subsidies uh, he has signed into law to try to get automakers to build more electric vehicles uh, and people to buy more electric vehicles. Biden's policy is he wants 50% of all new car sales to be electrics by uh, 2030. Um, so wh why is this a bad thing in, in the view of Republicans? Well, um, electric vehicles uh, have fewer parts. They require um, fewer workers to build them. Uh, from a technological perspective, that sounds like progress to me. I mean, that's the whole history of capitalism, which is that you, you build a better mousetrap, you, cr you become more efficient, uh, you improve your margins, and, and that's the way technology progresses. But uh, in the it, it put this in a political context, and I guess they're trying to turn that into a bad thing because it means there will be fewer uh, automaker jobs. Now, that is not 100 percent true because another thing Biden has done is create these incentives for manufacturers to build all these green energy plants 
uh, electric vehicle batteries and things like that to build these all in the United States instead of importing that. And that is actually happening. Uh, but Trump's not going to mention that. He just wants uh, he wants the auto workers and he wants voters, uh, especially in swing states like Michigan and Wisconsin, to think, oh, EVs must be bad. Um, Biden wants EVs. Therefore, I will vote for Trump. I have no idea if uh, he's going to get any traction with that line of reasoning. Uh, it's not really right, but he's going to give it a shot. Well, and then there's also another constituency in all of this, which is the auto dealers. We were talking a little bit earlier about CarMax. Um, for those who are selling EVs and being asked by the automakers to sell EVs, they're not necessarily very happy about it either because an EV doesn't need an oil change, right? It doesn't need as much service as a combustion engine does. So the dealers are not making the money on that aspect, right? So it's very interesting, all these competing constituencies here. What I'm curious about, Rick, also, is unions are traditionally very core uh, democratic you know, contingent here. Is that being upended? Trump is definitely trying to upend it. We could talk for the next 45 minutes about all the things you raised, Julie. Um, I mean, think, just go back to this argument. So, um, okay, say they, they, so electric vehicles require fewer, ma less maintenance. Don't all consumers want their products to require less maintenance? I mean, that is an unambiguously good thing for consumers. Um, and dealers, by the way, they, they are pretty good markups on a lot of these electric vehicles. Uh, so they're making pretty good money on a lot of them. Uh, to go back to the unions, um, the UAW not, uh, endorsed Joe Biden in 2020, which upset Donald Trump, obviously. So, you know, Mr. Vengeful, he was trying to get back at the UAW for this. The UAW has not yet endorsed Biden in 2024, but they almost certainly will. Uh, but Trump, at the same time, has gotten a very large portion of union vote for a Republican who is not endorsed by the union itself. That happened in 2016. And it happened in 2020. So a big part of what Donald Trump is trying to do, and probably the main thing he's trying to do, is just get some vengeance against the leadership of the United Auto Workers. And one of his other lines is that he's going to—he's been telling auto workers, "Your leadership has sold you down the river." That's his phrase, uh, and he wants to tell auto auto workers that their union leaders suck, and try to roil the union and see if he can just cause some mischief within the union. So. Um, you know, you can vote for whoever you want if you're in a union. You don't have to vote for the party that your union endorses. But Trump, in a way, is just trying to make trouble. And he's campaigning. He's trying to get the votes of blue-collar workers in Michigan. All right. We have to leave it there. But thank you, as always, Yahoo Finance's Rick Newman. All your Hi, markets guys. action ahead. Stay tuned. You're watching Yahoo Finance.
Lego facing a, a sustainability setback. The company backtracking on plans to make its iconic bricks from recycled plastic. The Financial Times first reporting the company changed its plans because it was unable to find a way to produce the toys with a lower carbon footprint. Uh, Julie, I've been I've been reading this story, and first of all, I love any time I can talk about Legos on sure, national international financial television. <laughs> here, uh, I grew up with them. I'm a big fan, but it looks like their 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 tent, their their desire to go green just isn't panning out here. And I'm looking through some of the technical in the weed stuff, and there are some decent reason, reasons here. Um, recycling is a very expensive endeavor. Mm. I'm not sure everybody realizes that, but just to get um, even 90% use out of something requires a lot of energy. And this is just not proving to be uh, very, it's a non-starter, I guess. I like this, yeah. So, so effectively what it sounds like is that the recycled plastic they wanted to use is not an, as easy a material to form into Legos. And so they would have to make an investment in all kinds of new equipment and new processes that would release more carbon than the original process yes. was going to create. So it just seems like the calculation they made is... It wasn't going to be worth it. It was a valiant try. And in the end, uh, I guess the newer material, the recycled material, as you said, was just a little bit too malleable. Here's a quote. It's like trying to make a bike out of wood rather than steel, or I would imagine trying to make a bike out of Legos. So it, it just didn't work out there. Some of those Lego bikes actually work, I, the little ones. I would love to try one. <laughs> we'll have Legos in the, in the booth next time. All right, well, on a related topic of sustainability, forecasters monitoring tropical storm Philippe amid what has been a record year for weather and climate disasters in the U.S. The increased risk of natural disasters sending insurance companies fleeing from states like California and Florida. Meanwhile, nearly 39 million properties have risk of increasing insurance prices or reduced coverage. This is according to a recent report by First Street Foundation to detail the financial implications of climate change for Americans. Jeremy Porter is joining us. He's First Street Foundation head of climate inspections. Thank you so much for being here. This is really interesting stuff, and the stakes are high for many, many, not just Americans, but citizens around the globe. But talking about insurance specifically, we have seen insurers pull out of some states. How widespread, Jeremy, do you think that that is going to end up being? How difficult going forward is it going to be for Americans to get their properties insured? Yeah, that's a really good point. I mean, the, the real question and the issue that we're dealing with at this point is the fact that we've accumulated this climate debt over the past few decades from increased disasters, increased exposure, increased inflation in, in recent years, increased cost of reinsurance. All of these things have compounded with the decisions on where we've made to develop in the past. And at, at the intersection of that is in, increased payouts that are having to be, be made by the insurance companies. And so insurance companies are simply responding to the fact that it's just not sustainable from an actuarial standpoint to continue to price premiums at the levels that they've been for, for decades. They've been increasing, but we've seen this huge spike recently. And when you roll on top of that regulatory policies that exist in some of the states, you end up with a, uh, a situation where insurance companies just can't do business in a way that, that makes sense for them. So they're, they're pulling out of, those, uh, out, of, out of those markets. And we have insurance largely regulated at the state level. So we have 50 different competing policies here. And then we have the various state governments with increasing or decreasing levels of, um, I guess, uh, activity in the insurance market. Let's take Florida, for example, where you have them as the last insurer of, uh, of wind damage, for instance. What, how, how are the state actors involved in this? And what is, do you think is their culpability um, what what needs to happen at the state level, if anything, to just raise the level of insurance back to its uh, traditional level or to, to its traditional role, which is you take a large group of people, a cohort, you charge them a small amount of money. And then when a damage strikes one part of them, uh, they get a payout. But it's it's financed by everybody. It just seems we've gotten away from that model a bit. Yeah, the, the insurer of last resort approach that, that we're talking about here, like the citizens uh, program in Florida is is really problematic in the sense that it's taking on the highest risk across the state. So it's not distributing that risk uh, across a portfolio in which it, it, it can it can sustain the impact of some of these disasters. Instead, what's happening is it's taking on high risk properties across the state. And Florida is pretty unique in the sense that the the insurer of last resort, which is really intended to be a residual insurance product, 
only reserved for the highest at risk properties has become the largest insurer in the state. In no other state is the insurer of last resort the largest insurer of the state. So it, it's on, it's both the largest insurer and it takes on uh, the highest risk properties in the state. And that's just not, not sustainable. And it, all it would take was one natural disaster to hit in one specific location and the, the program wouldn't be able to cover all the claims that would come in from the, from the damages. And Jeremy, as you say, we, we, and we've been showing on the screen some of the areas most affected by all this. And these are the areas we know about, right? We know about Florida. We talk about California frequently, Louisiana. Um, in your research, though, did you find, I mean, we are also showing West Virginia and Kentucky on there, which are not necessarily states that come to my mind immediately. So I guess what I'm asking is, as we see uh, an increase in wildfires, an increase in flooding in places that are not coastal, are we going to see more spikes in rakes and more um, insurers just pulling out of areas entirely? Yeah, the, the, the risk that we've seen recently from especially extreme precipitation events across the Midwest, across the Northeast, across the whole country, but really isolated in specific locations that are particularly vulnerable to that type of damage are in, in places like Kentucky, places like West Virginia, those are, are sort of the kind of ideal type places with the topography that allows for extreme precipitation to fill small waterways, flood small communities. And a lot of these places aren't actually in flood zones. So while, you know, the federal, the, the FEMA flood zones allow for the access to NFIP insurance for uh, properties that have some type of flood risk, we're actually finding out that about two times uh, the amount of properties that have one in a hundred year risk exists across the country that are in these FEMA zones. So about 50% of the properties with significant flood risk across the country don't even know they have this risk. They don't know that they should have flood insurance. And that becomes problematic when a disaster does, does happen. People have to pay out of pocket or they have to find some other way to pay for the damages that, that, that occur to their property. So Jeremy, what's sort of the end game of all of this? Is it that you see mass waves of people losing their homes as a result of, of some of these climate disasters? There, in, it, it's a really difficult question. Uh, we do think that climate needs to be priced into development, into where um, uh, new communities are planned. The, the biggest problem that we've had over the last half century, especially in regard to flood, is that we've been subsidizing development in areas that are of high risk. The NFIP just recently adjusted their NFIP pricing algorithm to what's called risk rating 2.0. Uh, the problem with that adjustment is that places like Southern Louisiana saw like a 600% increase on average in their, in their NFIP flood insurance. And for people that didn't necessarily choose to build in these areas, they just bought properties in areas that they thought were safe, that additional increase in home ownership uh, cost becomes uh, difficult to maintain for, for those property owners. They have a hard time you know, making their bills plus this additional four or $5,000 extra a year that now has to be accounted for in their, in their annual budget. So the, the, there will be property value impacts. We'll, we, we've already started to see that at the point of sale. Um, there's negotiations that are taking place where people are lowering the, the, the selling cost and the asking cost based on the fact that there's this additional cost of home ownership. But immediately we're, you know, from an institutional investor approach, this is being priced in right away from an asset valuation uh, perspective. We're already seeing discounts, seven, eight, nine percent on some of these properties, uh, just given the fact that there's these additional expenditures associated with the properties. And at a time when rates are high as well. So there are other high costs associated with home ownership. Jeremy Porter, really interesting stuff. Thanks a lot. Thanks for having me. Well, let's take a look at where stocks settled on the day, sponsored by Tasty Trade here. Um, after a mixed picture for a lot of the session, we ended up solidly in the green here, even for the Dow, which was the one that was wavering throughout the day, finished higher by 43 points. The S&P 500 up about four tenths of one percent. The Nasdaq finishing at the highs of the session, too. Especially fascinating that the Nasdaq did this well, given those higher 10-year yields. The 10-year at 4.55%. It's still kind of mystifying because even in the last week when we saw that surge up, mega caps, a lot of these growth stocks that were the stalwarts of the early price action of the year, well, they weren't hurt that much. And uh, so I think the resiliency of the market is actually quite remarkable. I agree there.
Yes, indeed. All right, coming up, we're going to go around the horn with some of today's top stories. Getty Images is updating its content game with a new AI tool. We'll break down why this is a pivotal moment for the company's outlook. That's next. Welcome back to Yahoo Finance Live. Josh Schaefer here with Diane King Hall and Pras Subramanian. We're breaking down some of our favorite trending stories of the day. And whenever we're talking trending and we're talking something buzzy, yes. it feels like we're talking AI. Of Diane, course, of I course. know you have your eyes on an I AI have, story today. I mean, there have been several that have yeah. crossed our radar today, right? Uh, one that stood out to me today is this Getty Images story. And, you know, you want to call this kind of artistic license meets AI. Mm -hmm. So Getty partnering with the king of AI, NVIDIA, to launch. Uh, something that's being called generative AI by Getty Images, right? Uh, so what's interesting about this to me is we think about earlier this year, Getty had pursued some legal action against Stability AI about what they were doing, saying they were stealing some of their images, right? Mm. Uh, but now they're turning this kind of, or, or embracing AI. They said they had already been partnering with NVIDIA. Uh, and then in terms of using the images that using its platform to elevate its images using AI. Uh, and so it just shows the expanding use case for AI, right? Two big things that stood out to me is one, just seeing NVIDIA called out again for mm -hmm. being the company that's helping here. I feel like we keep seeing that and it came up mm -hmm. a lot over earnings season. People just openly saying NVIDIA is the driver, right? right? NVIDIA is the company we want to work with and they're going to help us build out that AI strategy. And then the other thing, Pross, that I thought about when I think of Getty Images, it's something we use here at Yahoo and plenty of newsrooms use to put images on the internet, right? A lot of newsrooms subscribe to Getty Images and then put them at the top of articles. And one thing that Getty said, according to the Bloomberg article, that they're not gonna be doing with this no. is licensing news photos. Because that's the first thing I thought of is, oh boy, <laughs> yeah. now we can get you know the deep fake kind of stuff we've talked right. about with AI and getting images that probably shouldn't be on the internet that aren't necessarily real with real powerful people. So it's good yeah. to see, for me at least, I think, to keep that part safe and not really work with that side of it yet. 
Yeah, I mean, there's a lot of questions there, right? So, you, Diane, you mentioned the fact that they sued Stability AI, right. which, which makes the stable diffusion, that, that product that people have been using a lot of to make those AI images that you're talking about, mm -hmm. that we don't want them to show Biden like riding a tractor in the middle of nowhere, right? But, you know, I think the issue there is now, so we're talking about maybe stock photos, right? Like we're talking about yeah. can, people who yeah. make stock photos, are they going to be upset about this? I don't know, we'll see. Are we going to have the ability to see, is there going to be a marking on these images so this is a AI generated image? And lastly, why not use it for, for new stuff, right? If I want a picture of a car dealership, I, I can't find one, just make one for me. Make one for me with Toyota Camrys <laughs> yes, on, 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 the, on the lot. To me, it gets dangerous with people, though. You could do yes, that. Yes, it does. It gets yeah. dangerous with yeah, people. Yeah, but the Toyota Camry lot, who cares? Sure. Yeah, that's a fair point. You know? I mean, maybe the dealer will care, but yeah. most so, but, but people wouldn't A care lot of questions, that. especially when they were against it before, AP is not doing this, right? They're, right. Big, they're big competitors, not doing getting into that world of this, like generated, AI generated images for commercial purposes, stock purposes, yeah. we'll see. Well, we get yeah. into this all the time, right? It's once you start having, well, we do news, but we kind of do news, and sometimes we don't do news, then you just get people on the internet nowadays that are confused, I think. But look, look uh, what Getty said is they are going to be rewarding, there's gonna be compensation for some of the images that they use mm -hmm. in this early phase of training this AI model. Uh, so I know we're looking at another trending story today, Pras, yeah. that's not in the AI well, space. We're, a lot of big trending stories today. I want to get through this one quickly because I want to go to Josh's story next. Yes. Of course, <laughs> but first, but first, AOC Tesla, big yes. news there. I was surprised. I watched this interview uh, on Sunday's talk show with Margaret Brennan and CBS, CBS uh, Face, Face the Nation, Nation. Mm. Uh, talking about how, go over big interview stuff, but basically she mentioned to, to AOC, who's a big liberal, big progressive, mm. union backer, labor backer, I hear you drive a Tesla. What's <laughs> going on with that? And she admitted, I couldn't believe it, she admitted to owning a Tesla. She bought it during the pandemic to drive back from D.C. and New York and her, her, her congressional district. Um, and the time she bought it, there was no real EVs that were out there that could go, I guess, that range that are made in the USA or whatever she said. You know, and now there are EVs that are made by union shops, by union uh, uh, automakers like Ford Mustang Mach-E, F1 right. Lightning, et cetera. So big picture, I was surprised she owned a Tesla, given all the news that yeah. Elon has been into recently. I was surprised. Yeah, I was uh, surprised. It was interesting to hear that. And also, I did the math on how long it would take mm. to get from the Bronx to D.C. And I was like, OK, there may be a case here. And I checked, you know, of course, we check with our autos expert on, yeah. OK, there wasn't really anything that kind of met that level of range. So she saved some face in terms of saying, OK, now she's in the market looking. She had two years to sell this, <laughs> two years to sell this car, right? Like, I'd just be Mustang buying Mustang came out two years ago. Came out two years ago. It's one of my favorite right? EVs. I think it's a cool looking car. It looks a little bit like the classic Mustang. Well, I'm a fan of the Mach-E. Yeah, right yeah. You know what? <laughs> AOC, better get with yeah. me. We gotta go test it out. Yeah. yeah. All right. We've the real trending this. story yes. of this Monday after a big money. NFL Sunday yesterday. Taylor Swift and Travis Kelsey. Taylor yes. Swift going to the Kansas City Chiefs game yesterday to watch Travis Kelsey. Some oh, people are calling that. it a date. Some people are calling it, it maybe not a date. date. We'll call totally it a date. A All right, Diane wants to call it a date. It was a okay. date. The mom was, it was there. It totally a date. There's footage. There's, look at that. We're, we're looking at footage of Love them. It. From, by the way, from this Jared viral Payton, video right? from Jarrett Payton, Who the is? son of Walter Payton, right? the famous NFL running back. Exactly. What are the odds of that? I mean, talk about, you know, capturing a moment here. Mm. And I love all the shout outs to, like, her songs during, mm -hmm. like, you know, the, some of the highlights in the game. Uh, you know, there was a highlight about, you know, just uh, making a pass, um, using blank space. As, yeah. yeah, I thought that was really I, cute. To me, it is, though, actually a little bit of a business lesson and we that we talked about a million times but just what taylor swift can bring to your business or your brand when you think about how big the nfl is how so, massive it is to bring in people that don't even watch the nfl yes. and get them to watch is yeah. huge I mean, so is it a publicity stunt or is this real no it's real look, <laughs> look at travis risen it up over there man. look at this guy's <laughs> outfit man i mean come on look look this was big people were watching it nfl is huge already but adding that extra element of Taylor Swift, there's already jokes about where is it playing next? Should we go to the game? Should we watch see for her? If Swift you start I going do, to the game, that'd be will. awesome. Some will, and it'll be a great crossover. But, and I do think it is real, even though I posed that question, because I don't know if you guys know, she's actually an Eagles fan. Yes. So where Travis's brother plays. Yes, right. exactly. But I gotta so. say, Josh, Kelsey, it makes my number one pick pick for him fantasy-wise, so much sweeter. So much sweeter. <laughs> My team gets so much, gets some attention, some fake attention. I love it. 
Taylor, Travis, and keep Taylor it going. Swift. By the way, Pross, you've yeah. told me my New Balance 550s are uncool. I didn't well, know you said that. Taylor Swift. Cool. Where are New right? Balance oh I never said that. They're trending on the New Balance say. website exactly. today. So. I got the New Balances on right now. I never <laughs> said. I never hate said. I never said. I never said. I bad. Obviously, never very cool. Those are comfortable. Wearing the 550s, have them trending oh, online. My. Again, partner with Taylor Swift. That is the lesson. Yeah. All right, we will have more Yahoo Finance live on the other side. You know it as a place you can get $5 chicken, $2 pizza slices, and now a doctor's visit. Well, maybe. Costco is announcing today it has partnered with telehealth platform Sesame Care to offer Costco members discounted prices for virtual or in-person appointments. Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kemlani has more. Anj. Hey, Jared, that's right. You're seeing Costco jump into the fray with what we now know as retail health, or as I like to call it, big box medicine, where you can get your health care services at the same place where you're shopping. So Costco just announced a partnership with a not very well-known uh, smaller telehealth platform called Sesame Care, and they really started off as, ironically enough, an Amazon style of sort of setting up an infrastructure for patients to make appointments with doctors, and that's either online or in person, kind of like ZocDoc, but a little bit more. And so what it's doing is uh, creating an access point for Costco members in particular. Uh, the relationship is not exclusive, so those who are accessing Sesame Care can continue to outside of this. But what Costco is offering is discounted prices. So $29, for example, for a virtual primary care visit, $72 for health checkups, $79 for virtual mental health therapy and 10% off of other services that Sesame Care provides. And I had a chat with one of the co-founders, Michael Botta, about what this really means, how this is helping uh, without adding additional costs because this is a cash pay process. And as we know, we're all still paying premiums for our health insurance. 
And Michael said that it's hard to get cash prices for a lot of things in healthcare. Most people don't think to ask, and most clinicians are not trying to be competitive in this space, but he added that that is actually an area where you can end up paying lower out-of-pocket costs, especially think about individuals who have higher premium or higher out-of-pocket costs, high, high deductible plan. And so this plays a role in sort of bringing down the cost of healthcare services that have been needed for quite some time. And you know, Costco, always staying on top of cost, no pun intended, a $1.50 hot dog just sticks out of my mind. If they can do that and keep the price the same, they can do just about anything, maybe. Thank you for that, Yahoo Finance's Anjali Kimlati. The government, a government shutdown now could force FEMA to stop all disaster and during the peak of hurricane season. Um, the government agency is already nearly stretched to its limits, and FEMA restricted its suspending back in August to only address life-threatening emergencies. The restriction means that thousands of projects to rebuild facilities and infrastructure after disasters, typically funded in large part by FEMA, they've been put on hold. Yahoo Finance's, Finance's Rochelle Akufo, she spoke with Craig Fugate, former FEMA administrator, to discuss what's at stake for the government if FEMA stopped and pulled back on disaster funding. Let's take a listen. About 5,000 employees um, will be put at risk in a, what they call lapse of funding if the government shuts down. So while disaster work can continue, because those funds don't end at the end of the fiscal year, but they're running out, all of the permanent workforce, uh, they have to go and, and do what we call, you know, each person, each position, what's going to be considered essential and what's got to go, you know, people that will have to go home and stop work. That could be, you know, of the 5,000 workforce, that could be, you know, 90% of the folks are at home, uh, not working their jobs and not supporting the disaster response teams. And so then when it comes to actually responding to disasters, as we're, we're in the peak of, you know, hurricane season, a lot of extreme weather continuing, what sort of, how do you see that affecting the response that FEMA's, that FEMA's able to give in the, in the event of some of these disasters? Well, I'll give an example. During one of the government short shutdowns during the Obama administration, uh, we had a tropical system form and we had to start calling staff back into FEMA headquarters in Washington, D.C. And many of these folks had been furloughed. Uh, they were... Uh, not required to stay there. Uh, fortunately, we were able to get hold of them and have them come in. And they were continuing to do that while not being paid. So then in terms of the most pressing needs then, in order to be able to have FEMA still respond to these disasters, what are the th key priorities that need to be funded for FEMA? Well, the big one is the disaster relief fund. And that's the fund that FEMA has already restricted permanent work until they either get a continuing resolution, which will put money back into it, or a separate supplemental. Uh, you know, this is the thing that with the continuing resolution, uh, it would replenish not only FEMA's operational budget, the base budget of the people that are permanent workforce, it would also put money back into the disaster relief fund. And that should allow FEMA to go back to allowing permanent work to go forward. As it is, those funds are still going down they still are able to respond to immediate needs. And that will not end with a lapse of funding. Those dollars are not a annual appropriation. So they can continue to do that work uh, starting October 1st. But the rest of the FEMA workforce, uh, up to 90% of them potentially could be sent home. And many of those permanent workforce are the people behind the scenes making sure the disaster team and those funds and all the resources they need are, are, are being met. So then when that happens, as you mentioned with the, with the previous uh, government shutdown then, who does the burden then fall on if, if FEMA isn't able to respond? How does that responsibility then get shared amongst other first responders? Well, what happens is it goes back to uh, the state and local governments and a very limited federal program of assistance in a lapse of funding. So when you shut down government, uh, you're shutting down not only disaster response, you're shutting down all the training programs, you're shutting down all the educational programs, and all the support that FEMA provides to state and local governments uh, that's not tied to immediate disaster will be shut down. Plus all of the work on all of the existing disasters, the permanent work, the rebuilding, the rebuilding that's taking place from the hurricanes that hit Florida, rebuilding from the Maui wildfires, all of that is still put on hold until they either get continuing resolution and funding back or separate supplemental. 
And I think the average person at home probably is, isn't aware of just how much this, this can be affecting people. So then in terms of if you're able to have the ear of lawmakers, what would you want them to know in this moment, considering the sort of hurricane season that we're in? You've got one constitutional duty, and that is to appropriate funds for the federal government to execute their mission. And so if they're not able to do that, well, where, does the, where does that leave people? How should they perhaps, if not pressure their local leaders, what sort of, what sort of thing can people actually at home do if, if their lawmakers aren't doing these things? Well, whether we have funding or not, it's still important that people have their own preparedness plans, know what they're gonna do uh, if a disaster happens. Uh, even with the federal government supporting state and local governments, it's not uncommon that in these big disasters, people need to be prepared for several days of disruptions to infrastructure, roads, and assistance. And so personal preparedness is key year round, uh, but you, you don't wanna be in a situation where you need somebody else to come uh, to you in the first day, unless you're injured or need immediate assistance, uh, because the teams are already under tremendous pressure with these reoccurring disasters. Uh, so personal preparedness is, is, is good, whether we have funding or not, uh, but again, I, I, I continue to implore that Congress needs to understand uh, these disruptions are not just a couple of days, even if they only go a weekend without funding. It causes a ripple effect. Think about all the people in Washington, D.C. right now that are not doing their normal jobs, but are preparing for a shutdown of government and continuing those essential operations, knowing that they will not be paid during that period. That was Craig Fuge, former FEMA administrator. And coming up, it's closing time here on Yahoo Finance. We recap the top stories of the day and get you set for everything you need to know tomorrow. Stick with us. It's closing time here at Yahoo Finance. Here's a look at some of the top stories of the day. Moody's issuing a warning over a possible government shutdown. The ratings agency saying a shutdown would be, quote, credit negative for the United States' credit rating. And Moody's is the last agency to still have a AAA rating on America's debt. Fitch most recently stripping the U.S. of its AAA rating in August. Unless Congress acts, the government will shut down on October 1st. Ford is taking a step back from an investment in its EV transformation. The automaker pausing work on a $3.5 billion battery plant in Michigan. 
The automaker citing concerns uh, to competitively about competitively operating the plant. It comes amid slowing EV sales and the future of EV tax credits. And also after the automaker has repeatedly increased its offer to the union in its contract negotiations, uh, the com- company telling Yahoo Finance we have not made any final decision about the planned investment there. And the Powerball jackpot is closing in on a billion dollars ahead of tonight's drawing. $785 million up for grabs, making it the ninth largest jackpot in history. If you do happen to be the lucky winner, the cash payout would be $367 million. I will take it. And time (laughs) now for what to watch on Tuesday. President Biden is set to travel to Michigan on Tuesday to join the picket line and stand in solidarity with the UAW workers. This comes as United Auto Workers' strike against the big three, GM, Ford, and Stellantis, enters its 11th day. While former President Trump has already announced a trip to Detroit on Wednesday evening to join striking union auto workers. And on the earnings front, Costco is set to report its first quarter results. Investors looking to get a closer read on the consumer spending front as a retailer showing relative strength heading into its earnings report. Costco seeing August sales increase of 5% following a 4.5% rise in July. And turning to the economic landscape, consumer confidence for the month of September is out Tuesday morning, 10 a.m. Eastern time. This coming after the index saw a reversal from the sharp uptick in July, with confidence pulling back in August. And that'll do it for today's Yahoo Finance Live. This is my first day officially doing this show. Jared's sitting in for Josh Lipton today. No, well, you'll be back be again. Back. I'm I'll be down sure. there tomorrow. I'll be down you on the floor. will be down on the floor tomorrow. Okay, put it right back here at 3 p.m. Eastern tomorrow for all of your business and finance coverage. Have a great day.